My guest today is Marie Conway, a foresight and futures advisor and researcher from Australia. If the work, if the outputs of the scenario process were to actually be used and be valuable in the organization, mm. if the thinking didn't change, then the action wouldn't change. That's what I'm trying to achieve with the courses is an accessible, um, easy to you know, interact with um, set of lessons that introduced people to this concept of foresight. Welcome to the 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators. My name is Klaus. I'm an innovation coach in Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of Germany. Innovators and creators from around the globe help each other by sharing highs and lows, their motivation and creative passions, as well as their favorite methods, tools and ideas. The name of the podcast comes from the 2.5% innovators from Rogers Diffusion of Innovation Theory. Find more details, all the episodes and transcripts at the2.5.net. Enjoy the show. Hello, Dr. Conway. Hello, Marie. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. It is morning here in Germany. Good afternoon to Australia. These different time zones always crack me up. I know these realities that we have in parallel, these different realities that we have in parallel uh, with, with uh, conversations across time zones is normal, but it still amazes me. Your evening is starting now. My morning is closing right now. How was your day? <laughs> Sorry, I just, look, what did I do today? <laughs> what did you do today? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to um, design another course. So I was starting work on that today. And uh, that's been... And that is one of the points I, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, today in, in our conversation, I wanted to look into your journey, building your methods and, and your business, which uh, we will be talking about soon, and get a glimpse into uh, starting with uh, foresight methods, which you offer, for example, these courses you just talked about. Marie, you are a fellow PhD. Yes, and <laughs> just. <laughs> just, yes. And from my own experience, I can say it's a very long process. It's uh, It can be very hard at times, uh, but it's also a very rewarding thing when you uh, start with an idea or a concept or uh, and, and then work on that and get clear clarity to, to that idea and develop methods and, and stuff like that. So... Uh, you much of what we want to, what we will be talking about is based on your dissertation um, and before we get into that what did you do before you started your PhD what was the the initial thing to start that I worked a long time ago in universities where I ended up as a planning director um, in here in Melbourne and while I was doing that I was um, I did my master's in educational administration. Um, I've worked, I'd only for, essentially I've only ever worked in universities like, until that point. Um, so I was very interested at that time in the relationship between academics and managers. And I started a PhD then on that topic, but for a number of reasons didn't continue. So I just started then to. Um, You, uh, that was around the same time I was um, beginning to use foresight for the first time in my work in those universities. So I, um, I started to do that and then I left un the university sector to set up my own business and uh, I did that in 2007 and, and that's what I've been doing ever since, although it's gone through um, three, three or four, well, it's just kept changing all the time. It's never been a like a, a linear business. It's it's a, you know let's go off here and explore that and we might do that and um, and I'll do that work, but I won't do that work. So, but through all that, all that business building, um, 
I, I wanted to finish my PhD on the university because I care about its future. And so when I founded Futures, I had a, I had a totally different context for my PhD that made me find a way to go back and do it. And um, as part of that PhD, um, I developed what I call the Futures Conversation Framework and, and then post-PhD, my business has taken another turn and, and I'm focusing now on um, how we think and talk about the future as opposed to the methods and the processes and the tools we use to actually use futures thinking in practice. So I've kind of um, I've reborn my business, rebirthed my business <laughs> um, in a new direction. But the PhD um, gave me the opportunity to, to kind of bring together a lot of things that I'd been working with and learning as I was, you know, since 2007, and, um, and, and they all informed this Futures Conversation framework. It started from a real problem, real questions you had at your work. Uh, you were looking for answers, let's put it that way, or, or, or better questions possibly. And uh, from there, you developed what you are using today and what you are also working on, working with uh, today. That's a long process, I understand. And sometimes good things take a long time. And, uh, and also things can, can take uh, weird changes over time. I experienced that myself uh, when I did my PhD. I, I had several changes in the objective of, uh, of the work. And I'm glad uh, that there were these changes. Yes, yeah, same happened to me. So, but now you are you you have a like a, a theoretical basis. You have a, a lot of work done uh, in your PhD. You have uh, you have sort of a, something to to base your business on, and. And uh, you said that universities is your thing, futures is your thing, uh, and you're combining that in a in a way also. I was wondering, is there anything else that that is sort of driving you to think about the future or futures, possible futures? When when I was um, at Swinburne University, trying to introduce foresight into the university's planning system. I decided that I would audit a course in Foresight. That was because we were teaching Foresight then as well at the university. And I thought, well, if I have to do this in practice, I should go and learn what it's all about. So I said I would just do the first module in that course. And I sat in that, well, it was online. And um, by the end of that year, I, I was a different person. <laughs> I, I, at the end of the year, we had to say what was the one thing we would take away from the course. And I immediately said, which is unusual for me because I think before I speak usually, but I said the thing that I'm walking away with is, is the, the notion or the concept that we are all responsible for future generations in the present. And, and that was kind of the trigger for me to begin thinking about um, what, this, what, what was this futures thing. And as Richard Slaughter said, because he was running the course at the time, when you're studying foresight, you have to work out what part of the global conversation you're going to add to. You know, where do you fit in the global conversation and what, what new things will you bring to that conversation? So when, when I left and I started my own business, that's, that's what I, I always had those two things going around in my head. So it's how can we think about futures in ways that allow us to create better futures by changing how we act in the present and at the same time ensuring that we do no harm to future generations, that the future is always in our conversations today and that we always take future impact into account when we're making decisions. Um, and that's taken different forms over the years, but I've come right back there <laughs> um, after, you know, after doing kind of 
convent what I call conventional consulting work, speaking and workshops and things like that. It's kind of come right back to this focus on on the quality and depth of our conversations about futures in all forms that are the core of how we um, begin to create uh, new perspectives in the present that help us act in new ways to create new futures. Yeah. You are focusing very much on, on these conversations. You have a, like a concept of four conversations that uh, your, your framework uh, um, includes. Is a conversation always the start of a future? Or is there other starts also? Well, I think futures are only made real when you articulate them in some way. So, you know, when you speak about them or you draw them or you create Lego towns and cities and <laughs> creations as, as you do sometimes or you do a game or, you know, until you actually create something, it, it stays up here in your head. So mm -hmm. I think futures... Futures is inherently collaborative, but as I talk about in the conversations work, that it starts with an individual recognizing that the way they think about the future needs to shift, needs to expand and deepen um, and make it conscious. So that's the start of somebody recognizing that they, there is a new way to think about futures, but ultimately futures are created by people having conversations of some sort, some mm -hmm. form. It doesn't have to be verbal, but, you know, some form of interaction and articulation of images. You have just talked about global conversations. Um, is that a point of view that might, that came from you being Australian and being, in my perception, so far away from everybody else? <laughs> Yeah, possibly. <laughs> there's quite, I mean, there's quite a few people you know, in Australia who, who use these approaches. Um, but I, when I first started working in the field, I joined the Association of Professional Futurists and I joined the World Future Studies Federation and I thought if I'm going to do this, then I, you know, I need to be involved in the field as well that um, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to have an impact of any sort mm -hmm. um, unless I'm I'm involved actively in the field. So um, that's what I did and that's that uh, that's how I mean it's a global community and I think if you're serious about this work and doing it effectively and learning for people who have gone before which is the other thing. You have to be involved in this uh, global conversation that goes on between futures people, but also the global conversation about how to do futures work and how to um, demonstrate the value and, and the need for this kind of thinking and practice mm -hmm. in today's world in particular. And learn from each other also on the way. Absolutely. That's critical. I learned so much. I mean, I st I'm still learning <laughs> from these people, um, even though you know I can't I can't be in the same room as them. You know, the listservs and the the online forums and things and the uh, virtual conferences. You're still learning from them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good that that we have Zoom and, and other things to work together. I, I think we have to define foresight for for a moment at least, because there's there might be a lot of people that don't know what it is. What is your idea, your definition of foresight, of your work? Um, I used to just say it was a way of thinking about the future to inform decision-making in the present, which it is. But now I focus much more on differentiating foresight as a cognitive capacity. So it's a mental capacity that we all have. It's a neurological capacity that we all have. Um, that allows us to imagine ourselves in possible futures. And I, I differentiate the cognitive capacity of, that is foresight from how we use that capacity and apply it. So 
when people talk about foresight as being the use of trends and developing scenarios, that's actually the application of our foresight capacities. It's, it's, it might be a fine, um, you know, point to make, but I think that's part of the problem that we have in the terminology of the field that just explodes every time someone new comes into the field. Everyone makes up their own definitions for foresight. But fundamentally, foresight um, is a neurological capacity that we all have. Um, it's a cognitive process first, how we think about the future. And our brains allow us to expand that thinking if we're aware of our foresight capacities. So for me at the moment, that's the most critical thing. If I can contribute one thing to the conversation, it would continue the work of other people around how can we surface and, and uh, apply our foresight capacities in practice. So it's more about that than exactly what we do, you know, how we do it. It's more about the how we think about it before we do it. It's the pre-step, I guess. So for me, foresight's a cognitive capacity that helps us um, imagine possible futures. Is that what you're also working on when you um, when you design a course, uh, that you sort of prepare the field for foresight processes, basically, and make it possible so that everybody basically can use foresight in their lives, not just in their working lives? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's that was one of the aims. Well, it is the aim. The first course, it's called The Basics of Foresight, and it is really an introductory overview of um, how we can find our foresight capacity and then how we can begin to use it in practice. But I think that's when you when people, it's very easy to run a foresight process with when you, scenarios, for example, um, there's a fairly defined process for that. So it's quite easy in a workshop situation to, to run that process and get outcomes. But what usually happens if you haven't integrated into your process design this need for people to have the mind shift, which is what Pierre Weck talked about um, when he was designing all these processes at Shell, was that there had to be a mindset a mindset shift. <laughs> um, if, if the work, if the outputs of the scenario process were to actually be used and be valuable in the organisation, if the thinking didn't change, then the action wouldn't change. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to achieve with the courses is an accessible, um, easy to you know, interact with um, set of lessons um, that introduce people to this concept of foresight, um, what it means, why it matters, how they can start to develop it. And, um, and then the second part of the course is now once you've become, become conscious of your foresight capacity, this is how you can begin to use it in your work and in your life. Yeah. I like that a lot because uh, what you also do is you bring people some um, questions, tools, and um, vocabulary for their individual use. But also, if you use the, the whole, if you take the course as a team, you have you speak the same language afterwards. You have the same ideas uh, you can you can discuss uh, later on for your foresight work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And ultimately, once I have it um, finessed enough, <laughs> and once I've added more videos, because everyone mm -hmm. wants more videos, um, and kind of, you know, packaged it better, I guess, um, then I, I think that, yeah, one of the things on my list is to explore how to get to, to offer it as um, for cohorts, so that uh, at the moment it's it's online, it's you know self-paced, independent study, but it all, it also fits into that kind of cohort framework as well, where a group of people would do it together, and and have the same language and have the same understanding of the concepts, or or have team trainings at the same time and and stuff. 
Let's talk about your business. You have uh, worked in universities. You have had your own business. You worked on your PhD. All these things take time. It's not very easy all the time. You sort of change the objective of your business after your PhD. And um, things get very messy over time when you do changes, when you start something new. Things are not clear all the time. Even if you have a good idea where you want to go to, there is things on the way that say road bumps, let's put it that way. From my understanding is that you are a person that is very, that values value, um, that takes things serious also. How do you cope with these roadblocks on the way, with these bumps that sort of maybe bring you new perspectives, but also hinder you getting forward when you start your business? I do like to plan. So before I start anything, I usually think about it quite a bit and think I've got it organised. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think with the, with my early business, I, I think I was still developing my foresight, my own foresight capacity and and my own understanding of myself as well as, a, as somebody who was running a business and what, where I could add the most value. So, so from, a, from this conventional consultancy approach, I, I veered away from public speaking um, because I really don't like that. It's not my, not my comfort zone. <laughs> But that's fine. That's okay. And so I moved more into um, just workshops and things like that. And and I wrote my first book. I thought I'd always wanted to write a book, and, and I thought, well, you know, I've got enough material now. I know enough <laughs> at the level that you know I know what I'm talking about. And so I wrote my first book, which was which was great. That's what I really wanted to do. And uh, not long after, that, I was doing my PhD at the same time that I wrote my book. So by the time I finished my book, my PhD took over. And that process of doing that, the whole time I was doing my PhD, especially the last couple of years, I kept thinking, I really don't want to go back to workshops anymore. <laughs> I really, I really, I would, I really want to write again. Um, because I really like writing and, and strangely enough, the PhD reminded me how much I like writing. Um, but it also changed my thinking about where I could have that impact, you know, where my contribution could be. And that was really about continuing to share my knowledge because I'd always done that from the time I set my business up in 2007. One of the things I wrote down was that I would share my knowledge. I wouldn't keep it to myself. And I wouldn't position myself as one of the gurus of the field or, you know, I wouldn't aim to be this kind of, uh, I can't think of the right words, like this packaged personality <laughs> that you sometimes get. Um, I, wouldn't, I didn't want to be a star. I wanted to be somebody who helped others to learn about this stuff um, to, to avoid them going through the process that I went through and being thrown in the deep end. And so um, by the time I got to my end of my PhD, I had a pretty clear idea that I didn't want to do workshops anymore. I wanted to write. I wanted to share my knowledge in new ways. And um, an online course seemed to be um, to be possibly the best way to do that for me. Um, if I wasn't going to go out and talk about it, in, well, I can't go out and talk about it in person at the moment. Um, you know, I do, I do webinars sometimes, but, it, yeah, I thought, okay, the courses are what I'll do and at the same time I'll start working on making the foresight conversations, the futures conversations uh, framework more practical because they connect, the courses and the framework connect. Yeah. That's how I'll get the word out about it, I think. Yes, and, and you're also offering lots of stuff for free, and it's not just stuff, it's 
things that have lots of value. You're even offering some of that under the Creative Commons license, um, which I, I, I like a lot. And uh, when I, I, I look at, at your work, I mean, there's uh, books, um, there's these courses, um, there's conversations that you offer online, which, which help you to develop your business, but which also help others to sort of progress. I think this is a, a very nice, a very good mixture, getting along and sort of have win-win situations that are real. Mm. I, I like that helping aspect and that pragmatic aspect, which I try to get into my work also, because there is so much people, uh, many people just need the Not the, just the theories, but the, the concept that help them to get the things done that they need to achieve. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things I've always done is being available as well. Yes. Um, so if someone had a question or, you know, they could, lots of people do still do that now, just email and say, um, can I interview you about this? And you think, Okay, send me an email, send me an email. Um, but also I think with the Futures Conversation Framework, I tried something new in, in setting up this community where we had, where we're having online meetings to help me make sense of this framework in practice. And that was new for me because I, I usually develop all this stuff on my own. Um, but it's been really valuable to do that um, the input has been great um, but the actual logistics of doing it have you know hit some um, hit some obstacles along the way uh, and so it's been interesting to have to kind of you know I, I'm in the, I, I've organized this group of people um, and I have to I have to you know give them something <laughs> <laughs> and we have <laughs> and it has to be it has to be professional you know but you know I can't continue to do it that way for a whole lot of reasons I can't continue to do it that way so I have to pull back and restart again and um, and that was actually quite difficult to, I've done it twice <laughs> um, <laughs> but I realized I you know you get this sense that something's not working properly and and something has to change and so Ultimately, you come to the stage where you make the decision and you change and you, you move in a, di a slightly different direction to, so that the logistics of it actually allow you to do what you want to do rather than getting in your way. But I think that, um, as, as Joseph Boris said in the course at Swinburne, which has stayed with me all the time, is that when you're doing this work, at, you know, in workshops and things like that, um, you know, don't push it too hard and don't get stuck and just trust yourself and trust emergence that that what needs to happen will emerge so i've always um i've always held that <laughs> held that close and um and so far it's it's working but at the time when you're when you're readjusting and you know changing what you plan to do and what you told everybody else you were going to do but now you're changing it um yeah it's a bit uncomfortable but that's like i can tell you from from my perspective is that i see that as that's life yes it's also experimenting it's a very brave thing to do to sort of set on an idea that you have thought of a long time, then start executing on that idea, finding out that it doesn't work or it produces different results or other results than expected, and then declare that as an experiment and change the way you go uh, further. And it's something that a scientist in a lab would do. Yes, Absolutely. My husband's a scientist. <laughs> so yes, it's it's a scientific approach that you 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 experiment and if it mm. fails, you do you know you do something else. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't fail, you build on it. Yeah. You don't have to be a PhD to do something like that in your business to do experimentation. No. But you just have to have the also the humility to do it and also the strength to sort of 
live the consequences, as you just said, that it might be perceived as something other than it is a, an experiment. Yeah, yeah. I think when I set out, I had in my head, I had it as a prototype, but but um, I didn't really know what that meant either. I don't think. Um, but I think that's and and this isn't new, but that whole. It's the design thinking side of things that that you can't you have you have to test you have to test instead of saying this is the way we do it in future studies um, we we need to just say well we'll try this and see if it works and if it doesn't work we'll take the best from it and we'll try something else mm-hmm. and I think in in my context anyway that's been working quite well mm-hmm. but. Um, in a work situation, I always tell people to um, to do to to customize what they do to suit their context and to start small, because uh, you don't want to sort of proclaim foresight as the next big thing, <laughs> because we did that once <laughs> in a university and it doesn't work. People get very annoyed by you know this proclamation that foresight's going to solve all their problems. But the other thing with using it in organisations is that you have to have you have to have a culture in organisations that allows that um, experimentation, testing, prototyping um, process to happen. Without you know, the, the failure is accepted and the change is, is accepted, and that things can go can veer off path, but there'll be a new pathway as well. Mm. So I think the cultural side of organisations is also quite important. Mm. But, yeah, but for me it was a totally new way of operating because I'm usually quite, quite you know, organised and planned and that's where I'm going and that's what I do. So I think my PhD taught me that. But <laughs> <laughs> that you can veer off path and come back onto a new one and it's absolutely fine. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you're in a very lucky position. You you do the the thing that you do basically for yourself. But what I admire a lot is that you uh, have sort of started conversations with other people that give you the feedback that uh, allow you to be sort of vulnerable, vulnerable, difficult word, vulnerable, um, and doing these experiments that sort of stick with you and and give you questions and answers and feedback. And I think that's a very, very smart thing to do. And it's a global thing that you that you started. Yes, yeah, it is. It's people from all over the world. And I think what's happened is, you know, from the 50 or 60 people that were originally involved um, there's a much smaller group now um, in the community, but but um, it's a wonderful group of people. I mean, I just I enjoy our conversations, and I think um, I think it's a I think it's a two way thing that we're learning from each other. Even though I've got something that I want them to have a look, want, want people to have a look at and tell me what they think, it's still an open conversation um, about. Um, how uh, how this all help? Ultimately, it's about how can we help each other to to use futures approaches better. Um, yeah. For me, uh, a foresight process is um, part of the an innovation process, and it it has to, it is part of of uh, a required part. Let's put it that way of a of an innovation process, and um, and I. I What I, what, what I always see is that there is sort of some people think they are gurus and uh, they tell others how the, the future is going to be. And, uh, and that's never going to work from my perspective. It's always better to have a sort of basic training, a basic understanding of, of the basic methods um, and then have some tools, have some information, lots of information, let's put it that way, and put that together in your own foresight.
side process and then your own horizons that you develop and scenarios. They might not be as perfect, but they might be much closer to your own world. So I think that sets the basis for, for an innovation process. And you don't have to do that all the time, but you do that once a year, once every two years, then you're, you're good to go, I think, in a company or, or on a personal level also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Agree. So what what you're going to do right now is you you sort of forming an um, a portfolio of uh, items that help to do foresight work. Uh, one is, uh, for example, the book that you that you have on Amazon, and then the courses, uh, the conversations you have uh, on online. Um, What is the perspective, or what is the what? What do you plan to to have, say, in two years with your courses? What will they do? What what will be the functions or the the themes of these courses? Right now, I have the first one, the basics of foresight. The second one that I started work on today, finally, is on the courses uh, on the futures conversation framework. That will really be designed for practitioners or people who want to use uh, foresight approaches in their work, um, and it will capture a whole lot of um, uh, well, conversations that we need to have, but different types of conversations. But it will also provide people with um, uh, the different sorts of methods that you can use and how to use them. So It will have this, this, I guess, conceptual side around what foresight is and how we develop it and that kind of thing. Um, but it will also uh, ultimately be quite practical and, and I'm working on that now um, to, to a step-by-step -step or a process framework, I don't quite know what you call it, uh, to, to actually make this conceptual conversations framework practical and provide enough knowledge for people to be able to use this in practice in their organisations. So, you know, like I keep coming back to scenarios, but that's the most well-known method. Um, you know, there's so much written about scenarios and um, there's so, so much information and courses you can do to build scenarios. So... Ultimately, I, I mean, I, I don't want it to be, um, I was thinking mega. <laughs> I, I don't want it to kind of, you know, I don't know, become the next big thing because it won't be. I think I'm, what I'm doing is building on what goes on in the field and I'm reframing it in, in a new way, in a different way that brings together all the parts of the field that we already know about, but I'm putting them together in a new way. And it, what, what comes out at the other end is a different approach to doing futures. Okay, so it's not just making things digestible, which are very complex, but you're also adding, a, let's say, your personal touch by making things easy to use, for example, um, give that an extra perspective, uh, Uh, and so on. So it's it is a development also of the field. I think I think so. I mean, again, I don't go around saying, "Oh, look what I've developed." Aren't I great? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should. No, no, no. That's not me at all. I'm getting older. I mean, people on the podcast can't see I've got grey hair. <laughs> 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 But um, and I've been in the field for over 20 years. So I need at this point in my life, it's not about doing foresight, you know, all the time um, and being out there and doing foresight. It's more for me, I don't know, it's me, it's the type of person I am. But I, I, I've been reflecting on on this this field has changed my life, it did change my life. And I I want to leave it something, <laughs> something that's that's useful something that's practical, something that um, people can use to, um, to engage with this way of thinking and doing and, and hopefully um, have, have some of that 
same sort of shift in their lives as well because it's it 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 um yeah it, it's it it changed how I think it's it made my thinking much more expansive um much more accepting uh and I and it made me um conscious of you know the different perspectives there are in the world about everything and that nobody is right all the time so I think you know in that kind of thinking about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it it was really saying what do I want to leave the field with where do I want to make my mark because there's no point doing this work (laughs) I think everyone would think that they want to make their mark somewhere in what they're doing and so that's that's the the space I'm in at the moment. You know, what can I leave the field that is useful? I see. And I, I think what, what you're doing is also you are reducing it to the max in a way and uh, doing something minimal uh, with from taking stuff from a from where there's a lot of things, making it easily understandable and usable is a very, very difficult thing. What what uh, are, are you kind of a minimal person? Is that something that is in your lifestyle? Um, sort of. Um, I, I like to synthesize things I discovered. Um, I, I'm quite good at taking disparate information And, and finding the patterns across it. Um, and I think that's that's what I did in my PhD. Um, and I think that's what I've always done with it, without knowing it for a long time, that I can actually bring, bring that wide range of information together and, and make it usable and understandable um, in a new way. I think I'm I think I'm quite minimal in terms of my language in what I write and do because I really don't like um, jargon. <laughs> Although every field has its jargon. But um, you know, big words for big words' sake don't make any sense to me. Um, so but I think it's it's how can you develop something that's useful and accessible I think that's re- that's really what it is I think that if 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 we in the field really want our work to have impact in society then it has to be accessible it has to be accessible to people from outside the field and right now I mean it is accessible when you go through a formal process but there's other ways to make it accessible as well And right now that's happening. People are coming up with whole different ways of um, democratizing futures and foresight. And I think that's 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 the pathway we should all be on, mm-hmm. um, making it accessible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I've seen that with uh, like canvas approaches for all sorts of things in life. And they have changed basically business consulting the, the canvas posters and the canvas methods have given people the tools to do lots of things themselves after understanding um, the basic principles that doesn't mean that that gets them instant results but it sort of spreads the idea of working on specific things uh, over some time and putting effort and creativity into it will bring get you somewhere maybe not as far as with a good business consultant or coach but it will progress whatever you're working on and i think and i like that idea it changed my type of work but but i like that a lot because it brings more attention to things and um yeah lets people work on things that are important to them yeah i think it's um It's cumulative as well. If you if you start working in a new way, it might seem odd at the beginning, but the more you do it, you know, the more you use the, the business canvas or whatever canvas, whatever type of canvas you're using, it, it does start to change how you think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's and you know, in a neurological sense, forcing yourself <laughs> to do something new. 
and to repeat it over time will change how you think. So, you know, yeah, I agree. I think it's it's um, finding a new way to do something that you've already always done is is a good thing. So, we've mm. done strategic planning for far too long, um, and maybe you know, here's a different way I can provide you to do a different sort of strategic planning that's actually more futures focused and and more beneficial if you keep doing this over time. Mm. I I really like the way our conversation went. In the beginning, you said you don't know if if you fit in that in that line of guests <laughs> of the podcast, but I think you do very very much, and and I I really I'm really happy about our conversation, Marie. I think that was a fascinating glimpse at the way you run and develop your business, yeah, that you develop your courses, that you develop digital products, let's put it that way. I We will have all the links uh, of the things that we talked about uh, on the episode website. Uh, the link will be in the show notes. I'm following uh, your work. I'm, I, I really enjoy uh, these courses. Good luck with uh, working on the next course. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, thank you for the conversation. It was great. Well, thank you for taking the time. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. A transcript of this episode and additional information is also available. The link is in the show notes. My name is Klaus. I'm an innovation coach in Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of Germany. This is the 2.5.